All right, here we are. I've had dinner and I have one more part to go through. This last part, I don't really need to be that specific on, but I do want to show you the th structures of all these proteins. Now in our project, we're going to be looking at SARS-CoV-2 when it replicates in the cell. These proteins are the ones that get chopped up and they get turned into all the other um, peptides and MHC complexes that we see. And so uh, there's actually one paper that I'm going to focus on that goes through all of the different genes and it goes through them in order from N-terminal to C-terminal. In our project, I'm going to give each of you a different section of the genome. So depending on your section that you get, you will be working with these protein sequences. Now all that said, what we're working on is a limited question. Which of these sequences binds MHC and how much do they look like the, the um, relevant similar sequence in the other coronaviruses? But all the same, this is kind of cool for you to know what's going on, okay? So, let's get started. The main thing is there's lots of steps to a virus replicating. The main thing for us is that it gets into a cell, it makes polyproteins, and so it doesn't make a bunch of different proteins from the cell. In general, it makes one or two or just a few proteins that then get chopped up by its own protease. So it's like it makes the whole bolt of fabric and then the, the pattern, the protease goes through and cuts the dress out of the fabric. It's that kind of thing. And so um, once the different proteins are cut out, then they come back together again, they assemble, and then you have a bunch more viruses and the viruses leave the cell and they go on and infect other cells. All the technical details in figures like this that you can look at. The main thing that I just want to show is that the virus must replicate inside the cell as a couple of polyproteins that then get cut up by the own viral protease, okay? And so this is the initial event that starts everything out. The SARS spike protein interacts with the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cell. And the one thing about SARS, I'm sure that you know this by now, SARS has a lipid membrane about, around it. That's why we wash our hands to try to disrupt that lipid membrane. And so you have all sorts of things. It's also an RNA genome. The RNA genome is held in place by a, a nucleocapsid protein called N. And there's only four proteins that are in the virus in its infective form. Outside the cell, you just have spike, envelope, membrane, nucleocapsid, and then the RNA inside the lipid bubble. And it's the spike that is most exposed. And of course, that's why we focus on the spike when we're talking about antibodies and things like that. There's lots of different ways to show what the virus looks like. Here's four different artist takes. I've already shown you the one in the lower right, but there's three other ones that are cool. And in each of these, you can look for where the four structural proteins are going to be. S is always prominent. E is in the lipid membrane. N is in the RNA and M is sort of mixed in with the membrane. And um, so the spike is the most prominent and also the easiest to get the structure of. Here's sort of a Leonardo da Vinci style and you can see the four different proteins for this one. And here is my, uh, my favorite, David Goodsell, doing the different colors. He's thought a lot about the colors here. The N inside the virus gets purple. The outside of the virus gets pink and the extracellular milieu in which it's moving through is green, orange, and yellow. And so you can see very clearly the spike looks sort of feathery because it does have glycosylation on it, just like most other proteins in the extracellular matrix. So way back when I actually had this, um, this talk that I went through, and I'm not going to go through it in as much detail this year because honestly to me, this talk is one of my disappointments with the field. This talk was about how can we come up with small molecule drugs that will work against SARS-CoV-2. Instead, what really worked well was the mRNA vaccine based on the spike protein sequence. So um, you're always surprised by everything, but I thought for sure that one of these would turn out to be a useful therapeutic. We had remdesivir came out of this. It came out very early. But it also doesn't work that well when you actually do a double-blinded trial. Double-blinded trials are really high standards to make. There's a lot of variables. And so um, we can go back and look at this. This has a nice uh, representation of the genome of SARS-CoV-2. It's just 30,000 nucleotides long. And it starts from 0 over here to 30,000 on the right, 
Within that, there are two open reading frames in orange. Within each open reading frame, these are the polypeptides that get made, and they get cut up into two in, in, into uh, multiple different. There's 16 NSP proteins. Okay, so and those are all of the N terminus of the um, genome. And as you move down, you, then you get to the structural proteins S, E, M, and N. And then you have a couple other proteins that are actually outside the open reading frames. These get expressed on their own, pretty much. You see you have open reading frame ORF, 3A, 3B, and all the way up to 10. But these are also very small, and we don't necessarily know what they do or what their structure actually is. So you can see there's um, a couple dozen proteins that we're talking about in SARS-CoV-2 that's causing all this trouble. And there's three points of attack that they talked about in this seminar. You could get a drug that blocks viral entry. You could get a drug that blocks the protease action. And you get a, get a drug that stops the RNA polymerization. Each virus needs its own copy of the RNA. And so one of the other genes that's in this is um, a couple of these NSPs come together and they form an RNA polymerase that makes all the RNA that the baby viruses need. And each of these is a different enzyme with a different activity. And that means that it could be targeted with a different molecule. And so there's these three points of attack. What they talked about is you could block the door for cell entry with the spike. You could gum up the scissors with the proteases, or you could feed it bad RNA food with the polymerase. In fact, remdesivir is the last category. And so here is, unfortunately, this is not um, flexible like I was hoping. You can find this flexible, but you can imagine it's moving around like seaweed. This is a picture of the spike protein with glycosylation on it. It's one example of the possible glyc glycosylation that might be on the spike. And the main thing is to see it's a very flexible protein. You can imagine it sort of swimming, swimming around and even has larger movements than that. This is just its movement within one conformation. And then part of it swings out and makes a really big change. So it's a very dynamic protein. And um, we've made some great, it's the one that people have focused on most and we know a lot about it. So for example, here's the crystal structure of the spike protein. It's in sort of red, blue, and white. And then you have, here you, they changed the colors. I don't know why they did that, but they have the spike receptor binding domain down here, and the receptor binding domain binds the ACE2 receptor. And so you have the crystal structure of the blue ACE2 receptor up there. This is an actual crystal structure, but um, because we have a lot of crystal structures from SARS-CoV-1, you can also look up SARS-CoV-1 structures and do a little homology modeling, even use ITASR to try to get a decent homology model. But of course, you trust the crystal structure a little bit more, actual data. So one of the ways you could block the door is you can use your skills from Biochem 2, and you can make a recombinant version of the ACE2 receptor. And if you make a bunch of recombinant ACE2 receptors that are not connected to a cell, they will bind to the virus before the virus can bind to a cell. Uh, that's a real easy way to potentially make a protein therapeutic. Of course, making enough of it and delivering it to the right place are big problems. But there's this paper that talks about how you could do that. They made a recombinant version of um, the SARS-CoV-2, or actually, I'm sorry, it's the ACE2 binding domain only. And they made that, they put it through a size exclusion column, and you can see that they they got a nice single peak out, so it looks like it's well behaved. It looks like you have, it's the right size, and um, so everything's looking good for it being a well behaved protein in solution. And it could block the door. And if you, if you think back to Biochem 1, uh, when I went through it, I mentioned fold it which you can design proteins to fit other proteins. Well, as soon as the spike protein structure came out, they started running folded on it. And there's a whole paper around that. And they actually had 99 promising ways. And you see that they made these four helix bundles in green that bind the spike protein down here. This is the receptor binding domain in gray. And uh, they came up with lots of it. They actually used the community service to, uh, to be able to come up with these 99 ways. I haven't heard how these are doing, because honestly, it might be simpler to do antibodies. But if one of these works, it's a lot smaller than an antibody and likely to be a much better reagent chemically. So for proteases, we come up with a protease inhibitor. You remember those for chymotrypsin and things like that. 
Uh, here's a, the structure of one of the proteases. It has two. Uh, this is the, the structure is they immediately threw some inhibitors at it and they found, for example, this is the peptide that it cleaves. You can make a drug that looks like this green peptide and it could bind in the protease. And if there's enough of that drug around, the protease can't cut the polypeptide. And then you end up with no virus replicating, okay? And protease uh, pockets, pro protease drugs have worked really well. For example, is the HIV protease inhibitors have basically stopped HIV in its tracks. So the side chain pockets look like in chymotrypsin. Look at that P1, P2, P3. That's exactly the terminology that we use for chymotrypsin. And so it's the same kind of thinking that uh, was covered in the first part of the, the book. And so the other thing we can do is that we can feed the polymerase. We can block the RNA polymerase. So this won't look like a peptide. This will look like a nucleotide. But we feed it bad RNA food. So it will take it into its site, maybe incorporate it into the substrate, but then it will somehow gum up the works. And here they have an actual structure of the uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which makes all the RNA for SARS-CoV-2. And they got it through cryo-EM, and they have this picture. And uh, just notice how they use the hand metaphor. They have fingers, thumb, and palm, and it, the hand sort of closes around the RNA strand, and the RNA strand sort of shoots through the middle there to be able to polymerize. That beta hairpin down there was important to their conclusions. But the main thing is they um, were able to also model how remdesivir would fit in there because we know how cytidine fits in there. That's a normal nucleotide. That's good food for the RNA. Here is um, hydroxycytidine. So this is something that fits in the binding site but doesn't quite fit right. And it inhibits the action of the polymerase. And so it's a broad spectrum antiviral. And then here is remdesivir. A lot bigger, but you can see how it has the same nucleotide looking structures that you have here. Again, remdesivir was developed for Ebola, but it worked in vitro against SARS-CoV-2 polymerase. But working in vitro is not necessarily working in the patient. It does look like it does decrease hospital stays, but it doesn't necessarily save lives in the strict sense. It does help people get better, but it's sort of a moderate efficacy at best kind of small drug. And honestly, it's the best one we've got right now. There's a couple other that might be coming, but I never count on those until they actually happen. So I, the last thing I want to do is I want to go through this paper, which goes through all the crystal structures we have for all those proteins, the NSPs, the structural proteins, and the ORFs. So I'm going to go through this kind of fast, but if you're working on one of these proteins, you might be able to realize what that section that you're working on does. And actually, if it has an important function in the common cold coronavirus, as well as SARS-CoV-2, a common important function means that the residues will be conserved, which means it might be a peptide that the immune system could cross-react with. You see? So there's actually some good to knowing this. Okay, so we're going to start at the end terminus. We're going to move our way through. NSP1 is the first one, and it actually blocks the ribosome, the host cell protein synthesis. It turns down the host cell synthesis so that it can take the resources for itself. And it sort of gums up the um, these different ribosomal proteins, and you can see there's a little bit of the 40S ribosomal subunit down there. And it's just a little bitty yellow protein, but it sticks right in there. It messes up with host cell translation. Then we have NSP3, and as we move down, that actually has several different domains, and those get cut apart, and they can work independently. So there's the um, this macro domain X binds to ADP ribose and removes ADP ribose from the proteins. Apparently this gives it a selective advantage, but maybe there's an ADP ribose analog that would work really well against this particular protein and maybe it would help. Uh, on the other side we have the PL Pro and you see it's one of our proteases that they have the hand metaphor for. They're showing the thumb domain, fingers, and palm domain. So that's just one of the two protease complexes that is involved with it. The, um, so the PL Pro actually involves, uh, it actually cleaves the NSP1, 2, and 3. And you see right there the sequence, we know the sequence at which it binds, and so maybe we can make an inhibitor 
that looks like LXGG that will bind into its site specifically. NSP5, moving on down to another protease, it's also called MPRO, and this is the one that we showed before. This shows, um, and notice that the MPRO actually is 96% similar to the MPRO from SARS-CoV-1. It cleaves the two viral polyproteins apart. It has, we know the sequence, we know the binding site, we know that something could fit into it. And I believe this is the one that remdesivir fits into. I think one of these is remdesivir, but I'm not 100% sure. Oh, no, I'm wrong. What was I thinking? Uh, the NSP7 plus 8 plus 12 come together to make another hand complex. And this is the RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And this is where remdesivir goes through. You can see the NTP binding site here. So the string of RNA sort of shoots through the NSPs in this case, and it makes more RNA. So this is definitely crucial. If you zoom in on it, you can see the NTPs being polymerized right over here in F. And you can see, as you would expect from a world from dust, you see all the magnesiums that are involved in this. You always see magnesiums in these polymerases. So it makes this big dynamic complex, and here you can see sort of the primer and template RNA. That's why the last part of the book in Biochem 2 is important, because it talks about all these things. Moving on through the NSP, MSP9 forms a dimer, and um, I'm not sure if we know what this one does. It's an RNA binding protein, uh, so it's implicated in the virulence. But the thing is, because it's a dimer, this interface is something we could go after with the drug. Maybe we can make a small drug that will interfere with that dimer formation, and maybe that will be enough to mess up the virus. Moving on down, NSP13 is a helicase, which helps with the RNA replication. And NSP14 and 10 sort of go together. NSP14 is kind of a cool double function protein. It has two things it does. It's an exonuclease at the end terminus, and it's, it helps with proofreading. It's also a methyl transferase that methylates the viral RNA cap. This is all stuff that has to do with getting the RNA in the right form where it will make a lot of it in the cell and that it will self-assemble into the, the virion that will then leave the cell. So there's two sites, I believe there are two separate sites here, that NSP14 and 10 work together on. NSP10 is a scaffold protein that actually works with the second function. So we have two proteins and two functions. But NSP14 has two functions, and it shares the function, and possibly the binding site even, with the um, NSP10. The other interesting thing is I'm seeing zincs in there. So once again, a world from dust, zinc is important to these things. All the same, um, you can see how it gets complicated pretty fast. It's still a good thing to take zinc to help your immune system. But somehow, I can't imagine that taking zinc doesn't help the virus in some way. NSP15 looks like this. It's an endoribonuclease, and it cleaves the RNA. Again, gets the transcript of the RNA ready to um, be packaged and to uh, be in a form that will be processed by the cell's machinery. Um, all of these things are part of the cell's machinery for handling RNA, and so these are important. If we can block them with a drug, maybe we can have something that works. NSP16 also works with 10, so you see 10 is doing a dual function. It actually binds 16 as well, and it actually will do another um, viral mRNA modification. Okay, it uses the SAM, uh, the acetonesylmethionine cofactor, which is kind of cool because that's what you usually see when you're dealing with methylations. And so on down to the structural proteins, we've already talked a lot about spike, and I just want to point out the RBD on spike is hanging off the top there, and it folds in and out. So this is one confirmation that they're showing here. You've got to remember that it moves around. And the RBD, in part C right here, the RBD binds human ACE2. Spike is a really big protein. In fact, you could argue it's the most important protein, also the most important one, the most exposed protein, right? And so we have all this structural knowledge about spike now. The end protein is there to bind RNA inside the viral capsid. And so if it binds RNA, the RNA is positively charged, or ne negatively charged, I'm sorry, and acidic. The end protein is positively charged and basic. And you can see it's very basic, and uh, it helps to bind the acidic groups of the RNA and helps it pack all together. 
the M protein is shown here. We don't really, we only know the domains for it because it's mixed in with a membrane. Those are especially hard to find. For the E protein, it's a little tiny protein. You can see there's a lot of homology as compared to SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV right here. And you can see a lot of red residues that are identical among the three different viruses. And then we know it makes a pentameric structure of some sort that is somehow involved with the membrane. But again, we know less about these. They're also very small. So now we move on to the ORFs. And remember, these are just doing their own thing at the C terminus of the virus, and they are expressed separately. There might be something important about them. ORF3A actually forms pores in the host cell membrane, and so there's a whole class of drugs that is pore inhibitors, and they might be able to block that. ORF7A, we just don't know what the heck that does. And ORF8 and 9 will actually disrupt interferon signaling. So that brings us full circle to the beginning of today's topic. We talked about interferon signaling and about how important that is. Apparently it's important enough for SARS-CoV-2 to make two different proteins that mess with it. And uh, so that's one signal. Maybe we can make interferon and do some sort of interferon therapy where we give back the interferons to a patient that has a SARS-CoV-2 infection. The bottom line is, I just want to show you all this. You know how to look at these now. You're going to be working on some of these proteins. And so when in a spare moment, you can actually go and see what the structure is there. And you can even see the homology to SARS-CoV-1 and to MERS even. We're going to be looking at the homology specifically to the four common colds. So T cells can learn to recognize all of these. We're going to talk about these at the tour that uh, Fred Hutch is going to come up. And we're also going to do the project in later in May the second half of May, we're going to investigate how the peptide MHC interactions work and how they might be cross-reactivity, where if your immune system can recognize the common cold, it might also be able to recognize SARS-CoV-2. What are the chances and how much does that depend on which MHCs you are using? Just remember, antibodies are basically limited to spike and anything else they can see externally, which is mostly spike. T cells can see all of these. And so T cells can recognize all of these different proteins thanks to the MHC system and thanks to the whole cellular immunity system. So I want to say don't forget about that. Don't discount it. Don't be too freaked out when you see something about antibodies wane or this person X did not have enough antibodies. Are they going to be okay? Well, it's not just about the antibodies. I mean, more antibodies is good, right? But it's not just about the antibodies. The T cells are helping you out as well, the best they can. And we will investigate that more as we go through. All right. Thanks for your time listening, and um, I will see you in class.